run quick. If you have a Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. We're going to read quite a few verses today. 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 or 7. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in me by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble. As an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. That's a powerful verse. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall live with him. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. I know I'm going really fast, so hopefully these guys can keep up so you can read them all. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 8. This know also, in their last days, perilous shall, times shall come. Men will be lovers of their own self, covetous, boaster, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. All the parents said amen right there. <laughs> Unthankful. Boy, that is the truth about our generation. Unholy. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than God, having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort of they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins away with diverse lusts, ever learning. This is a powerful passage and not able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so did these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. But watch now in all things, endure affliction. Do the work of the evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry, for I am ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but also to them that love his appearing. James chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. We will pray, and we will kind of unpack all of these verses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Paul writing this letter to Timothy, and thank you for the way that he encouraged Timothy to stand strong in hard times and in, in pain, and just endure it. Go through times that are rough, Lord. We thank you for Paul's letter to Timothy and how it helps us today. Lord, we thank you for being holy and just and righteous and loving and merciful and kind. We thank you, Lord, that when we don't have it all together, you do. We thank you that when we don't want to see our pain, you see our pain, and yet you still see us through our pain. And Lord, we thank you that when others don't see what we're going through, you do. And Lord, even when we try to fool others and convince others that we're not going through anything at all and that life is perfect, Lord, somehow you still see through all of that. You still love us. And you have a beautiful plan for us, Lord. I pray that you would guide us, Lord. Lord, thank you for especially thinking of beautiful plans. Thank you for the beautiful plan that you put into place long ago when you planted one coffee bean and it sprouted and became a beautiful tree that grew and now we have coffee. It is a beautiful thing and we love it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We take Jesus and coffee really seriously. Not much else. So, uh, man, hey, we are uh, we're on week five. We're closing out this series that um, I think has been really helpful for me. I hope it's helped you. I think the truth is we all know someone who's difficult to deal with. Or at times, we are difficult to deal with. So we've talked about a couple different ones. We've talked about the bride of Frankenstein. That is uh, someone who will always let you down. We've talked about Cyclops. It is a person who only sees things from their point of view. They never change their mind. You cannot convince them that they're wrong on anything. We've talked about the Wolfman. It's a person who bites, criticizes, tears down, shreds. They use fear. They isolate. They try to control. Last week, we talked about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You never know what you're going to get out of this person. It may be one thing one week and one person the very next week. One week, they'll show up ready to worship with all their heart, and the next week, they'll be like, don't talk to me. <laughs> right? This week, we're talking about the hardest one to see, the Invisible Man. This is the hardest one for us to see. But I think Paul lined out a way 
of understanding the Invisible Man here. So let's talk about the movie first. The Invisible Man is a movie about a mysterious man. Hey, starts off right. Who shows up covered in bandages in a small town in England during a snowstorm. He orders a room in an inn. Of course the town is talking about this man because they want to know why he shows up during a snowstorm covered in bandages. He then begins to uh, order all of these chemicals to his room, over all these different orders of chemicals. Oh, man, just tons of them. And, of course, this has the town wondering, what is this man doing? Why is this strange man ordering all these things? Why is he covered up in bandages? Meanwhile, back in London, his fiance is desperately searching for him with her father. And they realize that he has ordered a powerful drug that helps turn people invisible but also destroys the mind. And they begin to search for him fast back to this small town in England because this is the way the movie goes. You're like, wait, what? What's going on here right now? Who is this? And the people are wondering, what's the deal with this guy? They begin to get curious. So one day, he begins to get more and more violent as the movie goes. One day, someone confronts him and he throws this person down the stairs. So then the town rushes up to greet him. He rips off the bandages, disappears, and all they know is that he's laughing hysterically somewhere and he wanders off. He begins to... Um, then set up a plan, because he's a villain, to take over the world. Like all good villains do, we're going to take over the world. His plan is to use his invisible powers to take over this world. He says he's going to throw in a few murders every now and then, and he's going to steal and all this stuff. And he begins to use people to do his evil tasks. He makes them steal things. He makes them set people up. One of those people that he, he uses turns on him, and he kills him. And then he has to kill a police officer. And eventually he just begins to keep going down this dark hole to now he is no longer the man who he was at the beginning of the movie. Now he is just evil. He is violent. But he has one big problem. He realizes that even though he's invisible, it's cold out and he has to have something to keep him warm. So he tries to steal from a shop. This doesn't go well. He has to run. He hides in a, in a barn. He decides to sleep under some hay to warm him up. But when he falls asleep, a farmer, God bless the farmers, Hears him snoring. Amen. <laughs> Hears him snoring. And he runs and tells the police. They surround the barn. They light the barn on fire. He runs out, but it's snowing. And they see his foot tracks. And as all of these monsters somehow seem to end, one of the police officers shoot him. And as he's lying in the snow, he turns back to who he once was at the very beginning of the movie. Now, maybe hearing that and thinking, what does that have to do with me? I think, personally... The Invisible Man is the hardest monster to see because it's the monster that's in all of us. I think personally, we all struggle with certain things, and we don't want to admit it. We all have pain in our life. We have all had hard, tough, rough moments. And sometimes the other monsters that we've talked about have caused it. Maybe, maybe uh, the Bride of Frankenstein has let you down over and over and over and over again and has caused you a ton of pain. Maybe you have someone who no matter what you try, no matter how much you try to help, help and solve and, and, hey, let's fix this issue, they say no, 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 and they don't want help. Maybe it's the wolf man, someone who bites, someone who criticizes, someone who tears down, and you have this pain in your life. It could be that it's an overly emotional person and you don't know which side of them is going to come out this week. They may be wonderful, they may be rough the next time, you don't know. It could be much worse than just someone who's difficult to deal with. I was talking to a pastor this week and we were, we were talking about abuse and, and he said, you know, truthfully, I'm finding out that abuse is not like the, the rarity, it's, it's what, it's, it happens to everyone almost. And the rare person is the one who's not been hurt. And I think what happens in our life is much like this doctor tried to take this chemical to disguise himself, we often try to disguise and cover our pain because we don't want to deal with it. Truthfully, we don't want to have to deal with it. We don't want to have to think about how rough and how, how much this person that we trusted or loved has hurt us. And so we try to cover it up. And I'm going to go quick today because we have communion, but we do this in a couple of ways. In our effort to make our pain invisible, we often make ourselves invisible instead. We often don't want to deal with pain. We don't want to look at pain. We don't want to associate with pain. We don't want to think about pain. But in the process of hiding the pain, we end up being the one who is hidden. And all of a sudden, about halfway through our life, people are like, well, I don't even recognize you anymore. You ever see yourself as a kid on a, on a, on a movie? And you're like, boy, where did that person go? I was so happy then. This happens all the time. I think, number one, the way we try to do this is through the blame game. 
the blame game. We will blame anyone and anything else besides what really caused the pain. Because it's easier to blame my spouse for something silly and to expect that they will just get over it and deal with it than it is to see what happened to me as a child or in my career that caused this deep, hurtful pain and to process and deal with that. Uh, listen, we had so much fun with the Bride of Frankenstein. We had a good time with Cyclops. We had a lot of fun with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. A little bit of fun with that one. <laughs> the Wolfman was a little bit intense. This one, I'm just going to lay it all out there. This is really what happens. We will blame everyone and anyone and anything and everything in our lives as an effort to say, I don't want to think about what happened. I don't want to deal with this disappointment of someone who just keeps letting me down. So instead, this, okay, this happened to my wife recently. I'm going to tell her story. I hope she's okay. She's in here, so, uh-oh. Pray for me. Um, <laughs> usually she's in nursery and I can just tell stories. Like, you're my wife. <laughs> um, recently she was cut off by someone. She was driving. They cut her off. They pulled over. They got out. They started screaming at her. Called her a bunch of bad names. Got in the car and took off. She was asking me, like, what do you even do? And I was telling her a little bit about this message. I think that often people who, who just have this burst of rage, they're really not mad at you. You, 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 didn't, you didn't cut them off on purpose. They're, they know that. They're not really upset at you, but they probably in their life don't have, they have some deep pain that they don't want to deal. And let's be honest, it's easier to get mad at our football team. It's easier to get mad at our spouse. It's easier to get mad at our coworkers. It's easier to get mad at the person who doesn't get our, I mean, it's a cup of coffee. Why do we get so upset? You didn't get this right. It's a cup of coffee. But it's easier to blame someone else for how we feel than it is to really look at the real pain. To really look at what, boy, this really happened and this is really hurtful and this is really tough. My daughter, um, she does this thing, we're trying to potty train her. She's 17, so it's about time. <laughs> My daughter, so we're trying to potty train her and she knows she should go to the bathroom. She knows that she should use the potty. But sometimes it's more fun to play, right? But she's also embarrassed of the fact that she doesn't. So I will be walking through the house, and all of a sudden I'll look over, and my daughter will be in the corner going like this, waving her hands at me. And she'll go, don't see me. Don't see me. You don't see me. And I'm like, I'm like oh, okay, all right. Okay, I don't see you. Like, and I walk off. This is what we do with our pain. It's what we do with what has happened to us. With when people hurt us, we often say, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. It's easier for me to not see it than it is to deal with it. We play the blame game. Next game we play, look at that. We will look at anything else besides the pain. So here's what happens in our life. I, I use social media. I don't think social media is bad. I think it just reveals problems that we have in our nature. I don't think it causes problems, right? But what we do on social media is rather than deal with pain, oh, look at my house. Oh, look at my job. Look at how successful I am. Look at my new car. Look at how in shape I am. Much more in shape than my pastor. I crushed him to work out this week. I smoked him every day this week, Derek. It's not a big deal. Look at this. Look at that. Look at this. This is why we are so fascinated with celebrities. We want to look at anything or anyone rather than look at the ugly truth that we have pain in our life from somewhere and it is hurting and in an effort to make ourselves invisible we become invisible because we are so obsessed with hey check this out check that out check this out look at this look at that don't recognize that i hurt instead recognize that i have a big paycheck don't look at my pain just look at how cool my new car is don't look at my pain Look at the cool places I eat at. Don't you wish for once that we could all really post like what's real on Instagram? Like that would be, that would change the game. That would be rough. Picture of me fighting with my wife today. <laughs> right? Like my kid hiding in the corner. Like don't you wish that would happen? What we do so often is we want to look everywhere and anywhere besides of what happened to us that caused us to be in so much pain. Hey, look at this, look at that, look at this, look at that. Number three, let's have fun. Let's have fun. I will say this, I, I love our generation. I, I believe in our generation. I think our generation has so much potential, but this is our 
besetting sin right here. This is what we do. I think we've been taught it. And that big idea is this. If I have pain in my life, I'll just cover it up by having fun somewhere else or with someone else, and then I won't even notice the pain. We were taught this as kids. Hey, your brother bullies you? Go play arcade games. Go play uh, N64. Go play Sega. You won't even notice that he bullies you anymore. Oh, you got a family member who abuses you? Just go listen to music. You won't even notice it anymore. Oh, just go watch a movie. Just go try this. Just go try that. Just go somewhere new. You don't have a friend? Get a new friend. We have been taught that the cure to our pain is to just have fun until we don't feel the pain. The problem is that pain doesn't work like this. It will resurface over and over and over and over again. And you can only go on so many trips. You can only get so many new friends. You can only have so much fun. You can only try so many fancy things before you realize, you know what, I'm still not happy. My marriage still isn't perfect. My spouse still does this. My family still does this. We did this, we did this, I got this, I got this, I brought this, we had this, and I still don't feel happy. Why? It's because we're trying to make our pain invisible by covering it up with fun. As long as we have fun, we're good. I love my parents. My mom, this is her strategy. Uh, we, as kids, hey, as long as we're having fun, everything's fine. And um, now we're all older, my siblings will fight. And my, they'll get, you know, quarreling, and one's in this room, and one's in that room, you know, whatever. And my mom will be like, let's have fun, <laughs> right? I think this is what we do with our pain. This is what we do with our depression. It's what we do with our anxiety. Not just have fun and I won't feel it anymore. How many new friends can we find before we figure out I'm still depressed? How many trips can we go on before we still feel angry? How much fun can we have before we figure out, boy, I still am the same person when I get back and the dishes are still in the sink and they're still dirty and my spouse doesn't clean up his socks. He leaves his socks. He played soccer on Thursday. They lost. He was upset. He took his socks off, threw them on the floor. They're still there. How much fun can we have before he picks up his socks? Right? We realize, we need to realize, as much fun as we can have won't cover up the fact that we have pain in our life and that pain comes from real places. This is the last one, the disappearing act. Disappearing act. This one seems to happen a lot. I just won't show up. I'll just disappear. I just won't go anymore. You know what? I just don't need to go to group. You know what? I just won't go to this. You know what? No one even likes me anyways. I won't go to church. You know what? They didn't notice my new shoes. Everyone complimented my hair instead of my shoes, and I bought new shoes, and I didn't do my hair, so I'm just not going to go anymore. <laughs> you know what? Everyone talked to Derek and Monica when they, when they announced they were getting married. They didn't talk to me. You know what? Everyone seems to like Cassandra. They don't seem to talk to me. You know what? Everyone says claps for the worship team. We don't clap for the greeters. I just won't show up. I'll just not come in. I'll just not go to my job. I'll just not go to my family events. I'll just show, I'll just disappear. Because you know what? They don't care anyways. When we begin to disappear, or if we do show up, we show up looking, how many times does this happen? I grew up in church my whole life. This happens over and over and over. We show up looking for reasons to get upset so we can leave. Well, you know what? They invited me to eat, but they only did it because they felt bad for me. You know what? They invited me to church because they only think they need to convert me. You know what? They did this because they only wanted to tell me what I was doing wrong. You know what? I don't think that they... And we look for reasons to disappear. We try to look at everything besides our pain. And then when we still feel pain, we blame it on the people that are around us. And we say, you know what? I'm done. How many times have we pulled ourselves away from our family and said, they just don't understand me. But we're the ones pulling ourselves away. I love, I, I say this all the time, but buffalo are my spirit animals. I love those things. I think they're so cool. Do you know which buffalo the wolves attack? They don't attack a whole herd. They attack whichever one pulls itself away. Satan's entire strategy in life 
He is not stronger than you. If you are a Christian, he has no power over you. None. So his entire strategy is to just get you mad at each other so that you will pull each other away because guess who has power over you? The other believers, and he knows it. So if he can get you upset and pull you away and make you disappear, he doesn't even have to fight you. So what does he do? You know, he didn't shake my hand. You know what? He didn't say anything about my clothes. You know what? I didn't get to wear the hat of amazingness this week. You know what? And he makes us find reasons to disappear into ourselves and then eventually pull away. And when he's got us separated, it's a lot easier to tell us, you just don't even go back. You're tired. You're tired. You're worn out. You're tired. You're tired. You've been working so hard, you don't need to go back. And he makes us disappear. In our effort to make our pain invisible, we become invisible. Here's what Satan knows. He knows that you cannot fix the problems that you refuse to see. You cannot fix a problem that you refuse to see. So here's what happens in life. You get hurt. No, I'm fine. I'll just have fun. Oh, you know what? My friend hurt me. I'll just get a new friend. Rather than deal with the pain, we try to add something else. We try to disappear. We try to blame someone. You ever wonder why a coworker blames you for something that didn't even happen? Probably because they're upset at someone at home and they need to play the blame game. And so we try all of these different things because Satan knows if we don't see the problem, we can't fix it. Usually the problem is right in front of our face and we refuse to even look at it. Because he knows. Boy, these Christians, listen. <sighs> I'm going to say this the right way. If we ever figured it out, we would change the world in like six weeks. Like if Christians ever figured out how much power God has and how much we can do through him, this world would be a completely different place. So he knows, yeah, I'll just get him to look, I'll just get him to do that, I'll just, I'll just distract him, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll get him over here, I'll get him upset at each other. I can't make them fall out of church, but I, you know what I can do? I can get them to get hurt, not look at it, instead blame someone else and not show up. I can do that. And all of a sudden, we don't fix problems simply because we refuse to see them. We often want someone to see us, but we don't want to see the pain. So how do we deal with the invisible man? Number one, we have to see the pain for what it is. It's pain. It hurts to be hurt. It stinks to be disappointed. It's upsetting to be just torn down by someone you love. I was talking to my wife about this this week. First time this has ever happened to me. Someone from another church in the state, they, they like decided for whatever reason that they didn't like us. So they got on a thing, they, got a whole, they figured out some stuff about us that they thought was true, which was the wrong thing, and they weren't even looking at the right thing. They called the, the part of churches were with North American Mission Board, they called them and said, kick them out, they're terrible. And it had nothing to do with what we were even doing. You know that stinks and that hurts and that's painful? And I had to call my wife and I was upset. I'm like, I can't believe this happened. It hurts. Do you know why it hurts? Because pain hurts. It hurts. You have been abused and that hurts. You have anxiety, it hurts. You have depression, it hurts. You have been disappointed, it hurts. Do you know why? Because sin is real. Sin is real. It is not God's fault that you got hurt. It is a result of sin. As a result of the fall of mankind, we hurt each other and it's painful and it's brutal and it's awful, but we cannot spend our lives trying to look everywhere and anywhere else besides at the pain. 